I'm here with the team from Judas and the Black Messiah, the star of the film, Daniel Kaluuya, uh, co-star Dominique Fishback, who plays Deborah Johnson in the movie, and the writer and director, Shaka King. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having us. Um, Shaka, I want to begin with you. I mean, you have Judas, Messiah, that, that Christian symbolism is right there in the title of the film. How did that frame of betrayal and, and maybe even sacrifice come to you in telling the story of Fred Hampton? Um, it's funny because the irony is that it came from a false history that had been put forth that William O'Neill was Fred Hampton's bodyguard. Hmm. That was the narrative that had been, um, that I'd read in all of the history books up until I spoke with Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. Um, and in speaking with him, he revealed that O'Neill wasn't his bodyguard, that they weren't close friends. And it, it forced myself and my co-writer Will Burston to go back and take a different approach to the storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense of it becoming more of a two-hander about these individuals who didn't have a close relationship but found each other very much embedded in, in one another's lives. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, I think because we were still working from that kind of Judas Messiah archetype, um, even though the actual history of the events was forcing us to go in a different direction. Technically, we were still in a sense trying to manipulate the audience into believing that they were watching a movie about two people who had a, some level of closeness. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately it is about a movie and it is about an, a significant act of betrayal. You know, O'Neill presenting himself as one person, you know, with one set of ideals mm -hmm. and obviously, you know, having ulterior motives. Um, so it it comes from a lie. <laughs> you know. But a lie that led you someplace productive, creatively, it yeah, sounds like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you're dealing with, uh, with very real history, even if it might be told from different perspectives. Um, and that brings a different set of responsibilities. And maybe primarily, or one of the ways anyhow, is around the casting of the film, the casting of your your Black Messiah and your Judas become really critical um, because these are real people, but there's also something larger than life about the story. How did you decide on, and how did you land uh, Daniel, uh, Dominique, Lakeith, the cast that you put together for this movie? You know, I wrote it for the three of them that you mentioned, Jesse Plemons as, as the fourth. I, I wrote it, we, you know, I always had them in mind when we were writing. Um, and it, the casting was 100% intuitive. Um, and you know, I'd seen Daniel in Get Out, Sicario, Black Mirror. I'd seen Dominique in The Deuce in Show Me a Hero. Um, and in that Jay-Z video uh, where she plays his mother. Um, and Lakeith, I'd seen in you know Atlanta and you know a bunch of smaller. I mean, honestly, Short Term Twelve was when I, he first came oh, on my yeah. radar, yes. and um, and we we expressed a desire to work together from then. Um, so, as much as I you know was aware of their work, the things that drew me to them as you know the the right actors for this role were not were not things that I think I was picking up on them from their work as much as it was just, you know, like I said, it, I don't, I can't really place where, where intuition comes from. I know mm -hmm. after I met with each of them, you know, uh, I mean, like I said, I had a relationship with Keith already and I knew, I knew him um, and I knew that he had, you know, just obviously a compelling nature to his ability as a performer, but also that he's a bit of a, you know, of a prankster. He's got mm -hmm. a lot of mis mischief, mis mischievousness in him. And so I, you know, I recognize that we could use a lot of that stuff, especially in, in terms of O'Neill up top, you know, when, when his, so that, you know, his almost youthful hijinks turn into this deplorable act over mm -hmm. the course of a film, but they mm -hmm. start from a place of just youthful hijinks and fun manipulation, right. you know, 
in, in Dominique, I, I saw a performer who is incredibly naturalistic, so much so that people think she's a non-actor, but mm -hmm. her craft is just so strong that you don't see all of the work that she's doing to portray this like living, breathing person. I knew she was playing a, an icon, a person. And so I wanted it to feel like a real person, not to feel mm -hmm. like a performance. And mm -hmm. I knew she could she could fulfill that. And Daniel, I met him and he was very clearly a leader. He was very clearly someone who had an incredible amount of gravitas, but also also possessed, you know, youthful charisma. And that was something that in reading about Chairman Fred Hampton, people always came back to the fact that you had almost these two different personality types in one body, not mm -hmm. to mention you're talking about a twenty one year old. Twenty one so years old. Twenty one years old. Yeah. It's where you find that that combination in one person, let alone a young person. So to discover that in Dale in our first meeting, in our first mm -hmm. interaction, it was like, oh, well, that's probably why, I, that's probably what I was picking up on. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 but it all starts from just a place of just being open and letting, you know, the spirits guide you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Daniel, uh, you know, there's a, a technical challenge here beyond what you did in Get Out and Queen and Slim and Black Panther or Widows, all great performances. Fred Hampton was a real person, not a fictional character. How did you and, and Shaka approach capturing him physically, the way he spoke, the way he moved, his energy? I think it's, um, I mean, Shaka did an incredible job, like, just let's go for it. You know I'm saying let's do it. Like, and we spent four days a year before the shoot, and we just did the speeches. And it's like sometimes you could just think your way, think too much. We just did it, and we and we spoke about what we heard, like me speaking, and like so through those conversations, Shaq was like, "Oh, a voice sounds like this to me," and have certain references. You know and saying, "I like this person, that person." I go, "Oh, well, that reminds me of this person," and I go, "This person." Then mm -hmm. we'd find the pocket. We get closer to the pocket. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And then. I got to go away, and you know what I'm saying? And, and actually we recorded that whole, um, that couple of days. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a couple of scenes, but we did mostly did the speeches. And um, and that really helped. When I looked back at it like a month later, I was like, oh, okay. I know where I'm at now. Okay, I think I know where to work, to what to work on, what's this. And, mm -hmm. and then yeah, and it's just working with my dialect coach, Audrey Lacrone, um, having, having conversation with her, and then Audrey would have conversations with Shaka. And I remember like, I actually was reminded about the read through. The read through was a big, was a big thing for me because it was petrified, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's very hard to like, it's very like, to your, you're at, like essentially at the beginning of the process, but mm -hmm. people, you're opening your process up to people that don't understand and you're in the middle of a process. Right. You know? They're right. going to judge you. Like, yeah. yeah. And it, that's but very vulnerable. It's very vulnerable. You know so, he wrote this for you, though. I mean, he wrote the role no, for no, you. This is what I'm trying to say. I, I like. I appreciate when people do that. I, want, I don't want to let them down. You mm. know what I'm saying? Like, I want to show up. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I, I don't. You just want it to be finished, but it's just yeah, at that time it can't be finished. And there's like execs watching it, and they're just watching it as if it's like a real thing. Like this is what you're gonna do. <laughs> but then obviously, when I get scared, I start giving it. Then minute I just go, oh, around, you know, I fucking get it. Then I. <laughs> <laughs> so great, I'm gonna get it, but it's uh, it, but that's part so of that great. again. Conversation that I had after I recorded that read through, listened to it back loads of time. The conversation that happened between me and Shaka after that read through was so important. Saying, "Oh, the conversation style needs um, a bit work, and this and that." Like the speeches, you're more there, but in the kind of his quieter moments, you need to work. And then I'd focus on that. I come back again, and you know, it's just it's a um, evolving. But it's you got to do the work. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, in between yeah. those in between those periods. Mm -hmm. um, Dominique. Part of the, the the work of writing was actually done by you as well, from what I understand. The the poem uh, that Deborah delivers uh, to Chairman Hampton in the film is something that you wrote. That's such a powerful moment. Can you talk talk about um, about just your approach to Deborah, but also about that piece of delivering those words to him? Because it's about more than just the poem. You're trying to tell Chairman Hampton something in that in that scene. Yeah, well, I'm just really thankful to Shaka for. Uh given me that kind of like ownership over the character and the development. And that kind of happened early on when we met, you know, he said, read the script and let me know your thoughts. So I gave him an email of all the things that I love. And I said, I have two thoughts, but I, I don't want to overstep. So let me know if you want to hear them. And he said, you, you can't overstep. You'll be playing her. Um, give me your notes. And that already, I said, oh, okay, this is really, you know, a lot of people talk about being a collaborator. But when it's something so massive as the story of Chairman Fred and also writing it and all this so 
many levels to it and so much responsibility that he, him being that open to hear what I had to say really allowed me to to um, step up in a different way and take ownership because, you know, I, I'm going to be the sole advocate for her once we start filming, you know, who's thinking about every aspect of, of the film and all of the characters. And so mm -hmm. really pick up those little things and kind of like text him that I've been thinking about this, you know, so while, um, uh, so he said, do you want to take a shot at the poem once I brought up the fact that we didn't really hear any poetry. So for, for that, I remember I didn't work on it. And then I get an email. He's like, how's that poem going? And I was like, <laughs> I started just writing because I realized that maybe it was a little bit of self-sabotage. Like I've been writing poetry since I was 15. But mm -hmm. when it came to this, I think I was kind of like, I'll get to it. And then he was like, oh. So I, I gave him a whole long poem and he just kind of took the, the heart of it and put it in. And um, every time we would get like a new script, I look and say, oh, the poem's still in there. But <laughs> but because he allowed me to write the poem, then I was like, well, could could she have a journal that she carries around everywhere? Mm. Yeah, you could do that. So I really started journaling. I journal as all of my characters, but with this, I really went um, mm. over, I kind of went over because I started looking at Daniel, writing poems about their first moments, their first mm -hmm. kids, like, building up the world inside because we don't really get to see that. but. As long as it's something inside of her, you might you be able to see it um, mm -hmm. in in her eyes. So you, you journal as the characters you're playing for every film. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I started doing that for Show Me a Hero, mm -hmm. um, and then Darlene a little bit more. But with with Project Power that I did with Jamie Foxx, that was too fast. Like mm -hmm. I would get new scenes like the day of, so I really couldn't journal, which mm -hmm. allowed me to trust in my instrument a little bit more. So I, with Deborah, it was it was a lot more fun because I really like I got to draw and it became a prop that we were using. Yeah. Really, mm -hmm. like ask them, I wouldn't leave the journal on set. They'd be like, "Oh, you know, <laughs> I, I'll stay. I'll stay." And with you still it. have it? You still have the journal? Oh yes, yes. Okay, good, good, good. Um, Daniel, um, you know there is this. When I was watching the movie. For me, there was a real fire and a real kind of unpredictability in this performance, which for me is consistent in everything I've seen you do. Um, to the point where I began thinking of what you're doing now in this film and others, um, as similar to what I saw Al Pacino doing, you know, in the movies from back from the early 70s. <laughs> Only there was something like brand new, you know? And and I really just felt like, my God, like this guy, you you just don't know what you're gonna get and it's all amazing. So to me, I'm gonna say you're, you're like early '70s Al Pacino right now. Oh, that's um, insane. Even that, that's my guy. That's insane that you. Is said it that. really? I didn't even know that. That's but, my girl. Hey, dog day afternoon. That's my guy, bro. Like that, that like he, that, that, yo, that's Al. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yes, that man. That's an incredible thing to you to say. So. Well, uh, I was gonna ask you, who are those actors that 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 you know? Are your North Star? Who who are you looking to in terms of you know work that's impressed you? You know what it is? It's funny that yeah. Like I, obviously there's people that like like Al Pacino, Denzel, like Daniel Day, Meryl Streep's Fire. Like the people are bad, yeah. But the reality, my favorite actors are child actors. Huh? Really? Why is that? Because they tell the truth. Hmm. They're not thinking. Mm -hmm. Like like. But for whatever reason, whenever I see a child actor, I'm just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, just, they, they, but it's like, and then something happens at 13 and they just get goes. Mm. Um, do you know what I'm saying? And, and like, but the, what they have before that, I I go, I'm reaching for that. Did you see a, did you see a movie called Capernaum? Yes. Oh, I've heard about it. I've heard yes. about it. Yeah. You have to watch it. You have yeah. to watch it. Yeah. yeah. the two best, in my opinion, arguably the two best performances by child actors of all time. Mm -hmm. One of them is a one-year-old. That's right. And he is blowing your mind in the mm -hmm. movie, yeah. acting. Mm -hmm. You have yeah. to see this movie. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's one of the best movies I've ever seen. Those two performances by those children are it is in astonishing. It's like, it's, like feeling, it's like feeling that it's essence is what mm -hmm. kids have. You see that with Beast of No Nation. Yeah. Abraham, right? Um, and he's just like, yeah, like what? Like you can never think of that. He just did it, mm -hmm. but he's not—he's not polluted by thought, right? He's 
polluted. That's what it is about him, that it's not polluted. And obviously Denzel is just like, like every scene Denzel does is iconic. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's just like a light. But there's something that about child actors, you're just like, wow, they're just there. And mm -hmm. I, I always try and reach for that. I was like, like in this film, I, I can never do those scenes again the next day. I, can, I can't do it in that way. That's all I try and reach for. Is like, I, I guess how right. I felt. I mean, um, but yeah, that's for me. Huh, okay. Um, this is a question for all of you, but maybe uh, Shaka, I'll ask you to start if you could. Um, you know, watching Judas and the Black Messiah, I feel like there's a moment happening right now um, with, you know, Lee Daniels' movie, The United States versus Billie Holiday, with Sam Pollard's documentary, MLK, FBI, Steve McQueen's uh, Small Acts, but especially Mangrove, all true stories of incredible abuse of power by the government against black people. Um, and I guess I just wonder in terms of your own film and maybe just like what we're all talking about right now, how can a film like yours change how we think about government power? Um, it's hmm, a good question. I, I'm kind of torn because I've I've like changed perspective on this so many times throughout oh, yeah. my my life. Honestly, as a just person who makes things, you know, I, I remember making a documentary about the effects of global capitalism on rap music when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed this this journalist who was like, he he was he talked about how, you know, when Public Enemy first came out, he thought that like a movement was going to spring out of, of that, and he he was like, but he realized soon after that you can't organize around a pop album, mm -hmm. and so it made me think a lot about just the role of art in social justice movements, and really. The only thing I think art is can provide largely, I, I should be specific, pop culture specifically. Mm. You know, when you're making something, you know, like if you make something small enough and you can get really, really specific because you don't need to necessarily court the viewership of millions of people. Um, but when you're looking to make something that I think permeates the masses in that way, uh, you're, you're essentially making entry level, you, you, what you're making is almost entry level commentary or entry level history. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, let's set the table. Let, let me tap your shoulder and let you know this thing happened in these broad strokes using these archetypes that you understand just as, you know, a person who's literally grown up hearing stories your entire life. But I'm not gonna bog you down with the specifics and the nitty gritty. That's for you to come to on your own, on your own mm -hmm. time. And hopefully we just inspire you to take an interest in these things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that that's the role of this film is mm -hmm. to just tap your shoulder and get you interested if you weren't otherwise. That's the whole reason to even couch it in genre and to not make, that's one of the reasons to couch it in genre and not make a traditional Fred Hampton biopic because a traditional Fred Hampton biopic, if you could have gotten made in Hollywood, which you couldn't have, but if you could have gotten it made, would have only courted the attention of people who had an interest in Fred Hampton and his politics already yeah. versus something like this film, which, you know, if you cut together a sexy trailer like Warner Brothers managed to do, folks who just want to go watch, you know, gunfire and, and think that they're, you know, going to watch, you know, a gangster film, they're going to end up finding something a little bit more than that. Mm hmm. Dominique, um, you were in The Hate You Give. Uh, Daniel, you were in one of the movies that people have embraced so much in terms of changing the way we think about Black people, Black Panther. And now you're in Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, what do you think about how movies can help shift how we think? Um, I mean, I need to support what Shaq is there. I kind of feel like it's... Um... Something that Chairman, Chairman Fred Jr. said to me, he said the the music doesn't make the streets, the street makes the music, hmm. you know? So we are articulating something that people, the public consciousness are not aware of. Mm. And, and so the people that are actually in the trenches day to day, showing up, whether it's like making sure people are released from jail, making sure people are fed and making sure their communities, like that they feel seen. Mm -hmm. feel 
um, feel like, oh, there's people, there's people out there that that speak to my point of view. So feel more emboldened about their point, their own point of view. Mm. And like Shaka says, to to pique the interest of people that are unaware, but they, they're just unaware because they haven't been exposed to it. Right. You know, it's, 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 that's why it's so important that they're, um, they're in, 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 a, in a populist context as opposed to an art house context. Mm -hmm. This is, um, it's, 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 it's really like people need to feel like they can access it and go to it and actually mm -hmm. like d digest the film as a film, as an entertaining film, but then go, oh yeah, this happened and then this. Mm -hmm. Or they just have a conversation with someone, like I had it with Soul. And I had this WhatsApp group, and they were like, I don't get it, I don't get it, I don't get it. And I was like, oh no, it means this, this, this. And like, oh, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's that. This yeah. is some your group of friends that is aware of it. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, this is what it was. And now they're more aware. Now I'm having a conversation with my friend and go, yeah, no, like, yeah, I'm not appreciating yeah. stuff like that. I'm not appreciating. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, like, it's, like, it's that, you know? It's like, um, I feel like that's what you do. But yeah, but Dominique, I don't know. What you, how do you feel? Um, well, just, Basically, like I didn't learn about this. I didn't learn about the Black Panther Party in, in in high school in history books, and and you know, and now we're learning that the history books were blatant lies anyway. So I feel like movies and art is like we're kind of uh, taking responsibility when we get to tell our own stories. We're taking responsibility for telling history, right? And then I think I think about something that Daniel told me around the time when uh, everybody was marching for. George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and I was feeling a bit hopeless about being an artist. And I had written a, a one woman show about the destruction of black identity. And I've been writing about this for a long time and hate to give and doing this. And I feel like, oh, maybe I'm just an artist. Like, when am I actually doing anything? Hmm. And uh, then you said something, I'm gonna butcher it. <laughs> but you said something along the lines of like, uh, if we're all one, then, you know, we and we're all one body, we don't expect the heart to do what the mind does and we don't expect the hands to do, you know, so everybody has a place and art has that place as well. So um, that's I do, when I think about these movies and I, and I think about us kind of uh, joining with the family, getting as much of the facts as we can to mm -hmm. put this movie out for everybody to see. And I often say to people, it's just a tool. It's not to take the movie and say, I know all there is to know about Chairman Fred. It's to say, oh, like I did a live yesterday and this 13 year old boy gets on my live and he says, I love that movie, bro, it was dope. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, did you did you, uh, did you, you Google Chairman Fred after that? He was like, no, no, I didn't. I said, will you? He's like, yeah, I'll do that tonight. I'll do that tonight. So it's really just kind of like sparking, sparking the minds like everybody said. Mm -hmm. There's a, a beautiful moment in the movie where you deliver the, the poem to Chairman Fred and then you tell him what he really is, in addition to being a revolutionary, a radical, a political leader uh, in the community, he's a poet. He's an artist as well, you know? There's something really uh, so powerful about the way that political leaders can use something like language, can use a creative art form to, to inspire people. And I think this movie does it beautifully. So thank you, thank you all. I'm just really so glad you made the movie. I'm so glad you, you're you bringing the Black Panthers, you know, to the big screen and to everybody. I had to put my leather jacket on today for that. Mm -hmm. So uh, so thank you all. And the turtleneck, uh, and the turtleneck. And the turtleneck, that's right, that's right. Hey, he's coming up strong, he's coming up hot, bro. <laughs> so listen, thank you all for being here. Dominique, Daniel, and Shaka, thank you for Judas and the Black Messiah. Thank, thank you. you, Cameron. Thank you. Thanks for doing this.